Hi, good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, we're just going to wait another couple of minutes just as the attendees start to come into the webinar and then we'll, we'll begin. Thanks very much. So as people start to come in, I think in the interest of time, we'll begin the webinar now. So uh, good morning uh, or good afternoon to everybody here, depending on, on where you are in the world. Um, my name is Constance Miller and I'm the Deputy Coordinator of the Global Bioenergy Partnership. Um, and welcome to this second webinar in the, um, in the 2023 series on the co-benefits of biogas and biomethane. And today uh, we'll be focusing specifically on uh, the, um, the use of uh, anaerobic digestion for managing wastes and residues. So as we know, management of dis and disposable of wastes is, is, a, is a major global issue. Um, and an anaerobic digestion offers a really good uh, opportunity for um, minimizing waste volumes and also uh, valorizing, valorizing wastes um, and uh, using the energy. So this webinar will be focusing on uh, the Europe, Europe as, a, as a case study, looking at policy incentives that are used um, for the installation of biogas plants in Europe. And we'll also have a, a case study from an innovative um, plant in France. Um, and we'll also be looking then at some methodologies um, that can be used to understand the replicability of these projects, of these policies um, in other regions and countries. So thank you very much uh, for being with us today. Um, our first uh, speaker is Lucille Seve from uh, the European Biogas Association. <clears throat> and she's going to give us a presentation on the policies to incentivize biogas production from waste and residues. So over to you, Lucille, please. Thank you, Constance. Um, so I will start sharing my screen. Um... Uh, can you see it now? Uh, not yet, no. Not sure whether you might want to share again. It's always the way it works in the practice and then never for the real thing. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you don't see it, no? No, you might try and share it again because I, it doesn't seem that it even shared. Okay. Um. Is it working now? Yeah, now we can see it. It's not in presentation mode yet. In like this? Uh, no, this is the other one. <laughs> okay, now we see it perfectly. Ah, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. So yes, I will uh, tell you a little bit about policies to uh, incentivize biogas production from waste, uh, mostly in Europe. Um, 
I will uh, first present you quickly what is uh, the European Biogas Association and who we represent. Then I will give you an, uh, a quick overview of the EU biogas and biomedicine production from bio waste, industrial waste and sewage sludge. And then I will present uh, two EU policies to incentivize uh, biogas production from waste. And I will also present uh, very quickly some case studies at national level. So first, uh, what is the European Biogas Association? Uh, so EBA, the main goal of the, the association is to scale up uh, biogas and biomedicine production and use in the EU. So we represent around 8,000 stakeholders along the whole value chain. Uh, we have in our membership uh, around 200 uh, companies um, and uh, 46 national associations from 28 countries and uh, also a research institute, uh, universities, etc. So, <clears throat> Um, then I wanted to uh, present some data that we gathered uh, regarding biogas production from waste, uh, which are also uh, available in our statistical report from uh, 2022. So um, first, uh, I have to show you this quickly. Uh, it's a slide which represents uh, our economic model based on circular economy. So today I decided to focus on three types of uh, feedstocks. So the first one is bio-waste. So according to the EU, uh, bio-waste is defined as biodegradable park, garden and park waste, food and kitchen waste from households, offices, restaurants, etc. Then there is uh, industrial organic waste. And finally, uh, sewage sludge. So coming both from uh, wastewater from households and uh, sometimes also the industry. Uh, thanks to anaerobic digestion, it can be transformed uh, into renewable energy, so biogas, that can be then used for uh, transport, for electricity or heat, or can also be uh, upgraded and injected uh, in the natural gas grid. And uh, of course, we should not forget ab about uh, two other valuable uh, co-products, uh, which are digestate, uh, that can be spread uh, after on agricultural fields, or further uh, processed, and also biogenic uh, CO2 that can be used uh, in specific products. So um, <clears throat> this is an overview uh, of the combined biogas and biomedicine production in the EU from 2011 to 2021. Uh, as you can see in 2021, our industry produced a bit more than uh, 18 billion cubic meters of biogases including 14.9 BCM of biogas and 3.5 BCM of biomedicine. So as you can see from the graph, the growth of biogas itself is stagnant, whereas most of the growth is located in biomedicine facilities. So there is a clear trend uh, towards an upgrade of the biogas into biomedicine. And you can also see that from 2020 to 2021, there was a year-over-year -year, uh, biomedicine growth of 20%. And we can forecast a never bigger increase for 2022, actually. Um, so here you can see the percentage of biogas and biomedicine that was produced per plant type in 2021. So as you can see, 64% uh, of the biogas and biomedicine in Europe is produced by uh, agricultural plants. But what is interesting to see is that uh, while 2% of the uh, biogas in Europe is produced from the organic uh, fraction of municipal solid waste, waste and uh, industrial waste, 22% uh, uh, of the biomethane is uh, produced from the same type of plants. So biomass and plants use uh, relatively more uh, bio waste and industrial waste than biogas plants. And uh, the reason behind this is uh, basically the newer uh, character of uh, biomethane plants, which better recognize the positive effects of digesting bio waste and uh, industrial waste. Uh, regarding sewage sludge, um, uh, the percentage of uh, plants using it is almost the same for the production of biomethane than uh, biogas. 
Uh, then this slide is about the newly installed uh, biomycin plants per feedstock type. Uh, so what we observe here uh, is the evolution of feedstock use from 2008 to 2021. So what has changed is the uh, energy crops uh, share in yellow, which has been uh, decreasing a lot since uh, 2017 with the adoption of the Renewable Energy Directive which uh, extended the sustainability requirement for biogas and biomycin. So in parallel, feedstocks that yield the best results in terms of GAG uh, emission savings, including uh, switch sludge and bio waste, have also been increasing uh, since then. Um, so what about the potential uh, by 2030? So uh, as you might know, uh, in the Repower EU plan uh, of the EU Commission, the sector has been tasked with delivering uh, 35 BCM of biomycin by 2030. So we believe we have the potential to reach that target, uh, even to exceed it, since we think uh, Europe could even produce uh, 41 BCM of biomycin by 2030. So here uh, you can see data from a gas for climate study published in July 2022, um, indicating the biomethane potential per uh, member state. But in link with uh, our topic today, what is even uh, more interesting is uh, this. So here you can see the fixed stock uh, potential in 2030. So what will be the fixed stocks used uh, to produce biomethane in 2030? And as you can see, animal manure will represent 32% uh, of the biomethane potential. Uh, industrial wastewater will represent 9%, uh, bio waste 5%, and sewage sludge 2%. So in total, 16% of biomethane would be produced from waste in uh, 2030. Um, and of course, the mobilization of sustainable feedstocks such as waste and wastewaters could be further maximized to increase this uh, potential. And uh, this is basically when a, a regulation comes in handy. So um, this is why I wanted to present uh, you quickly two examples of uh, EU regulation that are discussed at the moment at the EU level and which could uh, include uh, strong regulatory drivers to maximize biogas production from waste and wastewaters. So uh, currently at the EU level, uh, um, the, the treatment of urban wastewaters is uh, regulated by this uh, Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive, which uh, dates, dates back to uh, 1991. So it uh, definitely needed uh, an update. Um, and the objective of this di directive initially was to protect the environment from uh, negative effects on, of uh, wastewater discharges, uh, meaning that a member state um, were required to ensure that wastewater from all agglomeration above 2,000 inhabitants was collected and treated uh, according to EU minimum standards. Um, and it should be noted uh, that uh, urban wastewaters actually include wastewater from households, but also to a certain limit from uh, industry when, uh, when uh, authorized. Um, and so currently, the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive is being reviewed uh, and the EU Commission published its proposal uh, last October 2022. And the pro this proposal introduced an obligation to achieve energy neutrality for all urban wastewater treatment plants above 10,000 inhabitants by 2040. So um, it means that uh, member states will have to ensure that the total renewable, renewable energy produced at national level by all urban wastewater treatment plants is equivalent to the total annual energy used by all such urban wastewater treatment uh, plants. And uh, the article actually uh, indicates that there should be a particular focus to identify and utilize the potential for uh, biogas production. 
So this is, of course, a, a good example of a huge driver for implementing uh, anaerobic digestion in uh, urban wastewater uh, treatment plants, since um, AD is, of course, one of the best solutions to produce uh, renewable energy on site, while uh, reducing also significantly um, the volume of the sludge. Um, another example, so uh, regarding uh, bio waste and potentially also industrial wastewaters, uh, one policy driver that exists at the EU level is the Waste Framework Directive, uh, which regulates uh, waste management. So you might have heard um, of the mandatory bio waste separate collection that will be put in place from uh, the 1st January uh, 2024. Um, so this means basically that the organic fraction of municipal solid waste will need to be separated from the residual waste. Um, and so this lever uh, originated from the two, 2018 revision of the Waste Framework Directive. And this is, of course, an important driver for biogas production from uh, bio waste. And then uh, there is uh, the current revision of the Waste Framework di Directive, which could also have an impact on the biogas uh, and bioemission sector. So the proposal of the Commission is expected to be published uh, by the beginning of June. And the Commission might propose to set food waste reduction targets. Um, this, again, could be a driver for biogas production from food waste. And uh, it could be um, maybe food waste as part of municipal waste, but also of industrial waste, uh, because also food industry surpluses are uh, uh, an important feedstock for uh, biogas and biomethane. Um, and then there is the 2024 and 2028 revisions of the Waste Framework Directive that are already foreseen. Uh, and about this, the EU Commissioner for Environment uh, indicated um, that the revision could uh, actually target the prevention, preparing for reuse and recycling of waste, including specific waste stream. So, of course, there is not uh, much information uh, right now, but we could also imagine a specific target maybe uh, on uh, industrial wastewaters, including those that are not covered by the scope of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. So given the potential from uh, industrial wastewaters that I mentioned uh, previously, that could be, again, a strong driver for uh, biogas production. And finally, quickly, I wanted to show you uh, three small uh, case studies at uh, national level uh, related to separate collection of bio waste and biogas production from waste. Um, so the first one um, is uh, from Linköping uh, in Sweden. So originally, it started in this city in, 20, uh, in 2012, sorry. So they decided to implement a separate collection system for food waste from households, catering kitchens, shops, and restaurants. And uh, residents had to sort their food waste in a green bag. So the food waste from the green bags were then digested together with other substrates to turn it into biogas. Uh, and it worked so well that it was extended to the whole country. And by 2023, already 88% of the municipalities collect uh, source-separated uh, food waste. So the government um, has also set an additional target at uh, national level regarding food waste. Um, by uh, 2023, at least 75% of food waste will have to be sorted and treated biologically so that plant nutrients and biogas are recovered. So biogas production was directly uh, targeted there. Then there is the famous case of uh, Milano in Italy. So uh, there in, in 2012, uh, the use of transparent bag was uh, introduced um, instead of the black bag for the collection, collection of the residual fraction. So the objective was to check more easily for a bio waste fraction put together with a residual waste by mistake. Um, and they also implemented a door-to-door -door, uh, waste collection system achieved by a truck running on a biodiesel or a biomethane. And uh, the bio waste collected was systematically, 
systematically uh, treated through uh, AD for the production of biogas and compost. And as a result, millions overall uh, separate uh, collection rate was already reaching 62.6% uh, uh, in 2020. And uh, finally, a third case would be uh, Ljubljana in Slovenia. So from uh, 2011 in Ljubljana, a door-to-door -door collection system was also introduced. They also uh, lowered the frequency of uh, collection for residual waste while keeping at the same time the same frequency regarding the collection of recyclable and organic waste. And of course, they also designed a strong communication strategy focused on prevention and reuse. Uh, also in uh, 20, uh, 2015, a landfill center there was uh, transformed in a waste treatment center called uh, RCRO Ljubljana, so that you can see on the picture on the right. And this center uh, performed uh, anaerobic digestion uh, of bio waste for the whole city. And uh, by 2016, already more than 63% of collected uh, waste was sorted correctly and uh, hopefully uh, going to uh, anaerobic uh, digestion. So um, this, is, this is all I wanted to, uh, to tell you. Thank you for listening and uh, I will be happy to, uh, to answer any question uh, afterwards. Thank you very much, Lucille. An extremely interesting presentation there. And um, I, I really enjoyed also hearing about some of those case studies as well that seem to have been really big success stories. So um, I'll be, uh, we'll be taking questions for Lucille and then we'll be um, answering them during the discussion session. So please feel free to write any questions you have for her in the Q&A and we'll get to them towards the end of the webinar. Um, so now I'm going to pass the floor on to Jeffrey Karakachian and he is going to be um, giving us um, an, a case study, an innovative case study uh, from France. So the floor is yours, Jeffrey. Yes, thank you, Constance. Hello, everyone. So are you seeing my screen right now? Yes, it's perfect. Yes, thank perfect, you. okay. I just select this one, okay. So, uh, well, hello everyone. My name is Geoffrey Caracachian. I am a research engineer at the NG Lab Crisen, uh, which is the center of research and, and innovation of NG. And today I present to you a case study of an innovative technology uh, that will be implemented in France. And the aim of this technology is to boost the production of biomethane from agro-industrial waste. So this technology is part of a bigger project called Biometaverse, uh, which is co-funded by the European Union. And so to, to, to start, just a few slides about this project. So it began in 2022 and will end in March 2027. So we have 22 partners into this project around nine countries in Europe. So namely Ukraine, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, Greece, Italy, Spain, Belgium and France. And so we have just uh, under 10 million of funding with 70% uh, coming from the EU. And the goal, the main goal of the project is to diversify the technology basis for biomethane production in Europe and to increase uh, the cost effectiveness and to contribute to the, uh, the uptake overall of the biomethane technologies uh, in Europe. So we have five innovative biomethane technologies uh, into the project. So that will be implemented in the five European countries that you see in blue uh, on the map. So in Ukraine, Sweden, Greece, Italy, and France. So the pillars of the project is, of course, to demonstrate and assess uh, the, the power and the potential of these technologies to optimize them also. We also have uh, in the idea to go for the replicability of these uh, technologies, to watch also everything going from planning decision to policy and market penetration. And we also do a bit of uh, dissemination and communication, what I'm doing today. Um, regarding the main technologies, so uh, in France and the subject I will talk about today, uh, the technology is called electrometallogenesis. So both what we call can call in situ and ex situ, but into the project we also uh, investigate so ex situ catalytic methanation, ex situ biological methanation, ex situ syngas biological methanation, and in situ biological methanation. For the EMG, so electrometallogenesis, 
consortium, there, there are five main actors. So the LATAT, which is a research center based in Spain uh, that we work on a single chamber configuration. I will talk about that later. A DTU, a Technical University of Denmark that work on double chamber configuration. Friedrich Alexander Universität in Germany that work on technical support for design and overall operational optimization. IRIS in Spain that will uh, do the prototype development and the pilot construction. And so us, the Angela Prigen, that will implement the pilot and test the system on one of our anaerobic digestion sites. So this is uh, the site, so the demo site in France. The anaerobic digestion that you can see here is based in Ebbeville, in the Haute-France region, uh, in the north of France. So it is uh, a, a site that is treating mostly agro-industrial residues, uh, uh, around th uh, 35,000 tons per year. So it is mostly straws, animal effluents, a bit of agro-industries effluents also, and some sorting refusal, refusal sorry. And the unit injected its first uh, cubic meter of biomethane in December 2016. So it's, it's been some years right now. Uh, the main numbers about the unit, so we have just above uh, 1.8 million of cubic meter per year of biomethane produced. Uh, we can inject up to uh, 230 cubic uh, meter per hour into the, the natural gas grid. Regarding the digestion volume, you can see here we have two main digesters of more than uh, 2,000 cubic meter, one post digester here, and we have on the unit uh, 27,000 cubic meter of digested storage. The digestate is uh, valorized by land spreading uh, across the, the area uh, on 31 farms. So going into the technology, the innovative technology. So the electrometallogenesis, it's a bit new. It can be complicated. So I will try to, uh, to, to simplify it the, as much as I can. So it is at the frontier between electrolysis, so H2 production in situ, and biological methanation. So uh, the consumption, the transformation of H2 plus CO2 into CH4. So the technology relies on the use of electrodes. So a nanode and a cathode. Uh, which are inserted into directly into digestate or uh, a given medium. And so under voltage, uh, specific microorganisms that we call electrotrophic will use the current. And so we'll, if I can say so, uh, consume the electron and the proton to uh, create CH4 with the addition of CO2. So this is the one chamber reactor that is tested in Spain. So as you can see, there is no separation between anode and cathode, but we also have another uh, type of chamber, type of reactor, which is called a two-chamber reactor because we have a separation, a membrane between the anodic and the cathodic part. This membrane allows the, the, the proton to go through. And so into the cathodic part, it, we, we have the goal to have a better upgrading. And so we can uh, go to high concentration of CH4. And so we can inject directly into this compartment, either biogas coming from the main digester or CO2. Regarding the state of the art and the last results we, we had for the last years, uh, there are two philosophies for the, for the two chambers. So the first chamber, we see an overall boost of biogas production. So here you see a 90% boost of biogas with a 43% boost of CH4. So we boost the production of CH4, but we also produce CO2. On the other end, for the two chamber reactors, um, there we, we have a real upgrading towards high percentage of CH4 because we consume the CO2 and we see that we we go through to a high percentage. So we are nearly to 98%. So this is a lab scale study, of course, 98% of CH4 into the chamber. So by combining, combining the two, there is a real potential to, to do something right. Uh, so the, the ambition here is to increase the overall biomethane production on the AD unit by using the effluent digestate of the site, biogas of the main digester, and external green electricity from solar and wind. So on the site of Ebbville, we will, uh, we will implement 
uh, one cubic meter pilot reactor for the single chamber and the same for the double chamber reactor. We use really few uh, electric power source. So we have a voltage under two volts for the single chamber reactor. And we aim to have a surplus production of uh, around 100 liter of CH4 per cubic meter per day of reactor. So this would be a boost and add to the already existing pro production. Regarding the double chamber, uh, it is also, as I said, a one cubic meter pilot, and we will inject into the chamber, so biogas coming from the main digester, but also coming from the first, uh, first ch single chamber reactor to see if we can manage to, to boost the overall production for, from several sources. And the goal here is to upgrade to the maximum uh, concentration of, of methane into the, the gas. And so with the two chamber system, we can produce up to uh, 1000 liter of CH4 per day and per cubic meter of reactor volume. Today, the technology is at TRL4 and we aim to go to TRL6 or 7. The main challenges for these technologies, uh, so we have identified them uh, in, the, in the past years. We will do so uh, to, to resolve them, if I may say so, uh, some pre-pilot operation, pre-pilot testing that um, there are already uh, ongoing thanks to our partners with Lightite, DTU and FIU. Uh, this is a quick uh, resume here. So the goal will be to work on electrode pretreatments, bacteria, microorganism electrodes interaction, and substrate pretreatment to boost the biofilm connection between the electrode and the, the substrate, the biodegradability, the yield, and overall the, the CH4 production. That's for the performance challenges. For the operational one, we will try to see at uh, a, a scale of 10 to 15 liter uh, with pre-pilot, everything going from filling condition to the inoculation of the electrodes. Um, so that will be done in 23, 24. We also uh, have uh, some safety studies that will be done into 23-24, so an ASIT study, an ATAC study, and an ASAP study. So the goal is to overcome operational challenge with the pre-pilot operation to safely implement uh, the, the pilot on the site, and we will test uh, during one year in 25-26 the boast uh, chamber on the site of AV. Regarding uh, initial business perspective, uh, we know that direct usage of electricity to produce additional biomethane uh, will allow cheap uh, option for energy, energy storage. The goal is to use the excess renewable energy that cannot be injected into the electricity grid at some time because the EMG systems can be operated uh, intermittently according to the availability of the renewable energy. And the perspective of a in the perspective of a full-scale system, and based on the work we've done in the past, we hope to have a decrease of about 30% of the biomethane cost compared to 2022. And uh, thanks to our references of the, of the production that we have increased by 43% uh, compared to soil and aerobic digestion. Regarding policy, uh, right now in France, it needs a bit of a clarification uh, regarding new, new biomethane, so uh, synthesis biomethane or emethane. Um, but there are some ways to inject the, the, bio, the biomethane that we will produce thanks to a framework uh, that we call the regulatory sandbox that facilitated the implementation of an innovative project. And we also uh, will analyze, analyze uh, everything from cost, OPEX, CAPEX, to the operation. Uh, we managed to, to implement our uh, innovative pilot on the site. The performances, of course, biogas and biomethane production and the overall mass and energy balance. The goal of all that is to push towards market penetration for the technology and uh, stakeholder acceptation overall. I was quick. <laughs> I hope it was clear for you. Uh, so thank you for your uh, attention and I gladly answer to all the questions you can. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Wow, that was an extremely interesting 
extremely technical uh, presentation there. Um, <clears throat> but uh, no, really, really interesting. It's also uh, interesting to see the differences between those two uh, single chamber and double chamber technologies. So maybe we'll have to invite you back at the end of the project so you can tell us the outcomes of the of the two different ones there. Um, and also interesting to hear about the, the policies in France and how they're maybe not up to speed with uh, with these technological advances at the moment in terms of injecting biomethane into the grid. So um, thank you very much for that. So now we'll be um, moving on to our final speaker, uh, Stefano Porietti um, from Isinova. Um, and he's going to be discussing how we can, uh, the methodologies for the replicability of, um, of uh, policies uh, in different countries. So Stefano, the, the floor is yours. I... Yes, hello. Uh, good morning. I'm Stefano Proietti, uh, senior researcher of uh, Isinova. Among others, I'm also the uh, coordinator of the biometers project mentioned uh, mentioned before. Trying to share my screen. Uh, just a second. Um, just a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you see it? Yes, we do. Maybe you can make it uh, full screen. Uh, just a second. Yeah, that the at the bottom there's the button to make it full screen. Okay. Yeah, now it should be okay, right? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, Thank you good. very much. Stephanie. Thank you. Sorry for technical um, issues. Okay, uh, just uh, uh, we'll introduce um, its methodology that is to um, understand the replicability of national biomedium policy. Uh, is Innova, just a brief overview, we are a research consultancy company funded in 1971, uh, consolidated experience in several domains, long collaboration at national international level with, with the um, with the staff with the multidisciplinary background in different uh, domain. Uh, after advertising, let's move to the core of the presentation. The idea is to uh, here um, I mean, introduce uh, um, a replication methodology. We call it Aspire. This is the, the broad uh, uh, methodology uh, is inspiring decision makers, project developers. This, uh, this methodology allows to estimate the replication potential of different projects technological solution and policy in different contexts, in cities, in countries, in other contexts. This has been, this is an in-house uh, methodology developed by Isinova, a colleague of mine, Loriana Paolucci. It's already been applied in different European projects. It is versatile, versatile because can be applied to different topics and scales. And it relies on different tools based on the same methodological approach. As you can see, we, uh, we have CIT that is uh, applied to urban solution. Uh, in previous project, one of those is uh, um, rugged dice. We have MITS, then I'm going to introduce a bit more in details with the ranking analysis of different national policies. And we also have uh, other tools that have been going to be developed, including in Biometaverse project for technological solution applied to biometan. Um, how it works? Uh, 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 an in-depth focus on 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 uh, on meats. Uh, so uh, meats has been applied to regulatory project. This is that is all another project on biogas and uh, biometan. Uh, biometan. Uh, it aims to assess the replication potential of different biometan policies from advanced what we call advanced countries in what we call follower countries. So there is policy evaluation activity. Uh, based on ranking of policies in each what we in, in number of advanced countries uh, through a number of criteria, and then there is a replication assessment. It, the method is based on a quality quantitative approach to estimate the replication potential that uh, a number of policies might have in different contexts. Uh, so the, the, the results at the conclusion of this analysis 
can be relevant for other counties with similar uh, feature and priorities of, of, in, in follower counties. The, the methodology is based on questionnaire that um, from, from uh, expert in advanced and follower countries, and, and of course, complemented by comments and explanation uh, together with, let's say, the, the mathematical uh, values. Uh, there are different uh, the meets states for uh, um, different dimension. We have market effectiveness, ecosystem, time, and side effects, for which we have the meets acronym. There are policy variables and context variables. So policy variables are in the advanced countries. Uh, here we have potential for market transformation, cost efficiency, environmental impacts, persistency or impacts over time, and support of positive side effects. And then we have context variable in the follower countries, uh, interest from key players to invest in a specific policy, readiness of, of the regulatory framework, acceptance from the different stakeholders, the stability of the government institutional framework, and then responsiveness to a number of national plans and institutional priorities. Just a very brief overview, I mean, uh, on, on, on the mathematical uh, approach, there are an X axis and an Epsilon axis. So we are uh, in X axis, we put the, the variable depending on the specific characteristic on the policy in the in the advanced countries, while the, in the Epsilon axis, we, 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 we include the variables depending on the specific characteristic on the context where the policy is supposed to be replicated in the follower countries. So then we have a, a replicability axis that is, that is the intersection between policy and context. Of course, it's a bit more complex, but it's very easy, uh, just uh, an initial overview. Uh, the output is exactly uh, for each of the policy that we start to analyze. We have a number of values for the different uh, dimension and that the combination of those values provide an overall replication potential that is um, expressed in terms of, uh, of percentages. Just an example, an overview. Uh, here we have uh, um, a concrete application in the regulatory project mentioned it before. So I have a number of measures um, coming from Austria. So you can see the policies, guarantees of region system, regulation of transportation fuel, investment grants, green gas service agency, national emission trading system. Then according to this methodology, uh, we can apply and see and assess uh, which of those one can be most replicable in, in a number of countries. Here we have Belgium, Czech Republic, Ireland, Italy, uh, Lithuania, uh, Poland, and, and Spain. And then according to the, the, this uh, replication analysis, we have these values, uh, potential uh, for application in the different countries. So the, the measure from Austria has been here uh, reported uh, for application in Ireland, Czech Republic, and, and, and Belgium, and so on. This is the, just a very um, short example. So um, in brief, uh, the use of the replication methodology, it helps to identify successful policy in, in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in advanced countries, but also policy that can have not generated important impacts in terms of, of development of the biomedical se sector. And then the most replicable policy in the different national context. It is important to understand that this replicability assessment is influenced by a number of factors can go well behind the political priorities uh, identified by each of the countries. There are intrinsic specific feature of the of the policies uh, taken into account. And of course, there is the context where is to, where those policies are supposed to be uh, replicated. This was, I think, my last slide. Uh, thank you for attention. Of course, if you need more and more details, we are here to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefano. Uh, extremely interesting overview there, and I'd be interesting to hear maybe in the discussion um, some of the uh, replicability of the um, of the policies that were mentioned in the case study from from Jeffrey. Um, so that would be would be interesting if we can include that. Um, so now I'm going to pass over the floor to my colleague Tiziana Pirelli, who's the coordinator of GBEP, who will be moderating the discussion. So please uh, feel free to to write your questions in the chat. Um, but I'm sure she has lots of her own <laughs> as well. Uh, the floor is yours, Tiziana. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Connie, and to all the speakers, uh, because uh, uh, you gave us uh, really an overview of how things are uh, 
developing uh, regarding the biomethane uh, sector. And uh, uh, thanks a lot because uh, uh, you provided us with multiple information start up about uh, uh, all the phases of the value chains and all the uh, very important component of, uh, of uh, the development of this value chain. It's nice to hear that uh, policies are uh, changing and that uh, the um, uh, research and development is going uh, ahead and also that we are uh, analyzing all the policies to, to see how to uh, better support and uh, speed up the development of uh, uh, the sector um, from uh, uh, all point of view. So it's nice. Uh, um, I found many, many interesting points. And uh, uh, let me start. Uh, so I would like <laughs> to give the floor to someone from the audience uh, if uh, there is uh, some uh, questions. And uh, But I also have some uh, um, some question for our uh, speaker. So let's wait uh, just one minute if some uh, question comes from the audience, from our uh, uh, public. Uh, otherwise, uh, I would like uh, uh, Lucille to start from you. And uh, thank you so much for the very interesting overview that you gave us. And it seems that uh, we are improving in uh, or uh, finding a new uh, strategies and indeed improving in increasing the efficiency of collecting separately the different type of feedstock uh, and the different uh, type of uh, waste. So biomethane will uh, work as a uh, strategy for waste disposal in uh, um, in the future, do you uh, see uh, that? How many opportunity do you see to further improve this uh, uh, collection to take the best out from uh, organic waste? And do you think that uh, there is uh, some uh, um, uh, some uh, concern related to some possible competitive use for this waste, or do you think that the best way is uh, to collect them for biomethane uh, production? What could be uh, the uh, what could be in the future the scenarios uh, for uh, uh, waste uh, organic waste uh, collection? So uh, for bio waste, at least, I think that it's not really a feedstock that would be uh, at competition with the other use. Uh, and this is also one of the reasons why we uh, also focus on uh, on this type of feedstocks to, to be developed and to really mobilize a bio waste as a feedstock. And um, I would say that uh, one uh, other use that is uh, often mentioned is the uh, composting of bio waste, of course, but uh, those two are really complementary. And uh, uh, now uh, we are seeing more and more than a, a step of AD and aerobic digestion is as actually implementing also before composting. Uh, uh, so it's um, it's really more about complementarity, I would say, than uh, competition for uh, compost and uh, anaerobic digestion. So yes, that's what I would say. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, uh, from uh, uh, yeah, let's say that from the presentation of Jeffrey also uh, regarding the research and development, uh, we have seen that uh, uh, research is going ahead, trying to make the best use of the of digestate that could become somehow a feedstock itself in a circular economy approach for producing uh, uh, additional uh, energy. So, uh, uh, Jeffrey, do you uh, think that uh, this? Uh, it's a very quite interesting uh, to uh, this uh, to um, to know to have had an overview today about this uh, further uh, tentative to increase the efficiency and indeed uh, they, this is at pilot level, but it's uh, extremely important because we all know that in some particular context uh, the uh, distribution of digestate where there is not enough area, for instance, for distributing digestate or where in, in Europe we have uh, nitrate vulnerable zones 
zones. So it would be extremely important to find new way and to uh, use at uh, the best also the digestate, which is still uh, contains nutrients and the potential for generating additional value energy. So it's uh, uh, really important. Do you think that this will be feasible and how long it will take in your opinion to fast from the pilot to some uh, uh, higher tires, let's say? Well, for digestate, it's a really vast subject, but yeah, for our technology, we hope yeah, in, a, in a few years, but for digestate overall, there are several ways to valorize the digestate. So the most simple way is into the storage, you can already uh, have some excess of production. So you need, for example, to add a membrane that you can cover over the storage so that will add uh, a bit of production because for, for the weeks and months of, of storage there is uh, some methane that is still produced and regarding the, the problematic about, about the volume of digestate uh, there are some research uh, today uh, about some ways to transform the digestate into several parts so taking the liquid part taking the, the solid part and inside the liquid part there are several uh, sub parts if I may say so so this is maybe a way to separate and to valorize, uh, for example, potassium, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and taking take we can take the water, for example, to to give it back to the fields. So there is many things to do with digestate, and it will take some years. But research is on the is on the front on this, and there are already some uh, commercial products that can manage to transform digestate into a product and not just a waste. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have seen that uh, policies and technologies uh, go uh, hand in hand, let's say. And uh, so we are um, both sometimes the policies are the drivers of uh, the development of the technologies and sometimes is the technology to drive the policies. So Stefano, could you uh, tell us something uh, uh, how, on uh, how the methodology that you present today keep into account the local context, the reality of the local context, uh, but also uh, the, um, yeah, the improvement of the technologies, for instance, uh, and uh, the development of policies on the basis of the uh, uh, supply of the feedstock also at local level. You are muted, Stefano. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for this for this question. Of course, this methodology is uh, has multiple uh, perspective. In this case, we were analyzing uh, especially the, the effectiveness and the uh, replication potential of policies. Uh, as I was mentioning, in the meanwhile, we are also uh, developing. Uh, a, another part of this methodology for assessing uh, the real uh, the replication of technologies is, is exactly what we are doing in this other project by biometaverse um yeah so, so we are we are consider all those different aspects uh for sure as, as you were mentioning before uh policy is a driver definitely so it's probably uh, most of cases is is the triggering factor that can help to implement um projects in, in in many cases and this goes end in end with the with technology uh from also from this previous project i was mentioning for sure uh, one of the most effective policies is is, is uh, having a, a clear framework because especially for project developers you need clear uh, framework from regulatory point of view also from financial and economic point of view we in this project Riga Trace, we we among others we also developed and we drafted a number of uh, vision and strategy for I think thirteen or fourteen countries. In most of them, uh, the the one important policy, especially because Biomedan is still a kind of niche market. You need you still need in several cases you still need a clear uh, regulatory economy framework, including incentives. In most of cases, you still need incentives because, again, you have to 
fight, I would say, against a very consolidated and somehow not not even uh, not no is uh, let's say in, uh, competitive uh, com uh, industry of fossil fuels. So you still need uh, strong framework of incentives to 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 trigger and to have this. I would say maybe still still uh, still <laughs> growing. Uh, um, in the next in the next year, of course, in the in, in at the same time, industry is doing the their part of the job. So in most of cases, biomethane is already competitive, uh, but it's it's a, it's an ongoing process. So at, at this time, in most of it's, in several countries, you still need incentives to allow this um, this uh, uh, industry growing uh, uh, properly. Yes, uh, you are totally right. And at the beginning, we need somehow to uh, build an enabling policy framework yeah, to support the development also through incentives, but also through capacity building. And I think that this type of uh, um, meetings, events uh, to spread the knowledge on how things are uh, continue to uh, to develop are very relevant to allow people to, to know what is going on and, uh, uh, and what are also, uh, what is the vision no, for the future? Because indeed biomethane has a, a, a huge potential to uh, the uh, energy transition to, uh, but also to uh, somehow uh, create uh, um, uh, to, to reduce the use of fossil fuel, reduce the need for importing fossil fuels, and to uh, make all the countries and nations autonomous from this point of view. So not only reducing CO2 emission uh, or uh, GHG emission directly, but also contributing indirectly by replacing fossil fuels to uh, reduce further GHG emission. So uh, we I think that today we have somehow contributed to raise awareness on the importance of biomethane in the energy transition. And uh, raising awareness is extremely important to create this vision, both with a, not only with a top-down approach, let's say, driver by policies, but also as a bottom-up approach, because it's a need that all of us uh, have and I think that all of us should push somehow for the development uh, not only of uh, the policies but also of the research and uh, the technologies. So thank you so much for having contributed for to uh, this very interesting webinar. I think that many many people will look at the recording also in the future and we will um, be very happy to uh, come back to you in uh, a while, uh, Geoffrey and Stefano and Lucille, to see how things are developed in uh, one year, let's say, because uh, uh, you gave us a very interesting overview. I think that we should uh, continue keeping our audience updated on all these uh, relevant aspects. Thank you so much. With pleasure. And Connie, I will give you back the floor. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tiziana. Uh, as she mentioned, the recording will be available along with all of the presentations um, afterwards. And uh, I wish you all a very nice rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much.